All right, we are back inside of Unity, and we have taken a look at the models that we're going to be bringing in from Maya. They've been exported out in FBX. Now we just need to get them into Unity. Now, the first part of this process, well, I'm not even going to get to the first part of this process because I finally get to fix this nastiness I have in front of me. <laughs> uh, these rocks have been driving me crazy for a couple of videos now, so I'm going to select my terrain, and I, normally I would hit Shift Y, but it looks like I'm already in the Paint Details tool, so I'm going to hold down the Shift key and just erase these guys out. Now, after I put my tunnel in here, it's entirely possible that it would look better if I added some more rocks in, or maybe added in some trees, or maybe even re-sculpted parts of the terrain to snug it up a little bit where the, the tunnel is. And if you'd like to do that sort of thing, you're more than welcome to do it. That's totally cool. I'm not going to be doing it on my end, because really, it would just be showing you the same things over and over again, and I don't want this to... Uh, digress too much into just repeating things for vanity's sake. Right, we could spend hours and hours tweaking the level and showing you how to tweak it, or we could spend those hours and hours and teach you new things. That's right, so I want to get to the new stuff. So, uh, let's go ahead and hit Q, and that'll get us out of the uh, terrain tools, that'll get us back to the basic select tool. Then, we need to bring in our FBX files, and the first thing you should do, if you're going to bring in a new type of asset, any new type of asset, Make a folder for that type of asset so that you have a nice organized place for those things to go. So in my project view, here in the middle of my screen, down toward the bottom, I'm going to go under the Create dropdown and create a folder. Let's press F2 to name that folder. And F2 didn't really want to respond, or maybe I was just hitting the 2 key and only thought I was hitting F2. That sounds about right. <laughs> and let's name this my... FBX, or my keyboard fail. We could call it that too. And we'll press enter. Now, with this folder selected, I'm going to go up under the assets menu, jump down to import new asset. And here is our tunnel. So we're going to start off by bringing in the tunnel. Now, if you remember, in the last video, we exported the tunnel out at a scale factor of 1 instead of using a scale factor of 100, which is what we told you you should do. So if you didn't do that at some point, if you're just exporting stuff out and you do the standard one-to-one -one ratio, here's what's going to happen. Let's go ahead and click Import. Give it a little bit for it, the process. It's got to convert the FBX into a format it understands. That's Extract true. Extract all the, the uh, textures and, and create new materials for it and create a whole bunch of folders. And you see, because we had the FBX folder selected when we brought that in, everything drops in underneath this, which is nice and neat and, uh, of course, very organized. Now, I'm not going to point anything out right now, but the problem is already staring us in the face. Mm -hmm. Let's say we didn't know to look for that. So what we want to do is just get our tunnel placed in our level. And we've already done it a couple of times, but uh, you can drag and drop things straight from your project view right into the viewport to place them. It's actually a really convenient way to work. So let's take our tunnel, and this is the, the prefab that includes our mesh and all of the appropriate materials bolted onto it, and let's just drag this right in here to the middle of the zone. And for a second, unless you're looking really closely, in fact, at the resolution you guys might be viewing this, it might look like nothing happened at all. Something did happen. The problem is we have a tiny, teeny, incy weensy little tunnel that's been created. As a matter of fact, uh, make sure it is selected here inside the hierarchy panel, and then in the viewport, tap the F key, and here it is. Look, it's so cute. It's like this tiny little model tunnel. So obviously, that's a problem. Now, how do we get to that problem? Well, if we select the tunnel back here in the project view, we're going to go all the way back to the project version, not worry about fixing the one in the hierarchy, because that one's already in our scene. We'll fix the one that we imported, and then the one that is in our scene will simply update and come along for the ride. Right, this is actually our FBX that we brought in. That's right. Now, if we take a look here inside the FBX importer section in the inspector on the right-hand side of your screen, right about midway down, again, depending on your resolution, uh, you'll see a property called scale factor, which is set to 0.01. Even though in Maya, when we exported, we saw a scale factor of 1. Whatever number you saw in Maya is going to be divided by 100 by default when it comes into Unity. It's not the most fun thing in the world, but it's just kind of how it works. We, if we know it's uh, there, then we know to set our scale factor in Maya up to 100, and we don't have to deal with this. But we can fix it here, too. 
we can take our scale factor and change it from 0.01 to just plain Jane 1 and press enter. Now that alone doesn't do it. We have to scroll down to the bottom of the inspector and there's an apply button down here to take any settings that you might have made and actually apply them to the mesh. And now if we zoom out, whoops, and it's reimporting assets. So we'll give that just a moment. You accidentally oh, I dragged that. something in. That's okay. Well, no big deal. And we'll just zoom out to here, and we have a nicely sized tunnel, as you can see here. Right. Now, you may be wondering, it's like, well, if we can change it inside of Unity, why bother messing with it on the exporter in Maya? One of the problems that you'll find later as we get into more complex examples, particularly things that have um, rigs, skeletons, animation on it, if you scale it um, inside of the inspector in your FBX, that can break your animations. You can you can experience problems. It's just a good idea to take care of as much of that on the front end as you can. Mm -hmm. uh, once it becomes a habit, it'll just make things easier, especially if you've got uh, your... Uh, you know, your work divided up into teams, those who are working in Unity, you have asset creators who are working in Maya. Just tell them when you export out, make sure your scale factor is at 100 so that the folks working in Unity can just bring it in and stuff just works. Mm -hmm. So now we've got this in, but obviously we have at least a little bit of a problem because our fence looks absolutely terrible. So let's take a look at that. Here inside of our materials folder, we have our fence mat and our tunnel mat. Let's click on the fence mat. And there's a couple of things. We have uh, some other textures that are available here. Now, uh, the textures that came along include a bump map as well as the diffuse with an alpha. So the first thing I want to do before we even worry about getting this uh, tiling the right way is going ahead and changing the shader that we're using so that we can make use of uh, the fact that we have an alpha channel to punch out the inside of the chain link. And we have a bump map to give this a little more life, a little more realism, make it look like something other than a flat picture of chain link fence. Right. And for you that, uh, for you, those of you out there who aren't familiar what a shader is, it's actually a little program that tells the Unity engine, or more so, the graphics card, how to represent the textures that you're doing, uh, you're sending it. It's instructions on how to render and display the meshes that have this material on them. Great description. Now, by default, we're using a standard diffuse shader, and that will give you a result that's kind of like a rock or a chalkboard, something that's, that has no shine to it, no sheen. It's just kind of there. We're going to click on this and jump down to... Which one are we going to? Transparent. Transparent. Thank you. I, my brain kind of locked up for a minute. We're going to start with transparent and go to cutout. And the reason we're using cutout is because we have an alpha channel that we're going to use to determine what parts of the uh, material are visible and what parts aren't. And we're going to use bumped diffuse because we have a bump map and we have a diffuse map. And what that means is we'll have the ability to use a bump map. If you're unfamiliar with a bump map, I'm not going to get into the hardcore mechanics of it, but uh, it's a black and white image that allows you to simulate... Uh, lumps, bumps, uh, a, a kind of a tactile surface for your uh, your texture. And we'll use bump diffuse. Now as soon as we do that, suddenly we can see through everything because our alpha channel is pretty much already set up exactly the way it needs to be. So everything just kind of works. Now we can play with the alpha cutoff values here inside of our inspector and that controls at what point in the alpha channel we're chopping out. And you see if we go all the way to the left, we're not cutting anything out. So the, the key would be to find that nice value somewhere in between the two. Right. The alpha cutoff is a really good way to fine-tune if you're seeing some fringe artifacts on your right. texture to remove those. If some stray pixels are coming in, it's a great way to make those disappear. Fortunately for us, we're about to crank the tiling way up. And in doing that, that's going to make everything really small. And so if we had any little fringe artifacts coming along, unless they were really bad and really obvious, uh, they wouldn't really be all that visible anyway. Now, let's go ahead and set up our tiling. It's going to be here in the inspector in this tiling column for X and Y. Now, X and Y are analogous to U and V, respectively. So X is U, Y is V. Just keep that in mind. And what we had set up, I believe, was 25 in U. So let's do 25 in X. And then 20 in, uh, 20 in V, which will be 20 in Y. 
So let's put in 20 and press enter. Now, from a distance that will disappear because of MIP mapping. Mm -hmm. uh, basically what's happening is as we are backing away, that texture is getting simpler and simpler until we can't see it anymore. Don't stress about that for the time being. We're just gonna go ahead and let that kind of do its thing. But we can now see our texture. We see our chain link when we come in. And really, that's everything that I wanted to show there. We've got our tunnel in place. Now, did okay. you have something you want to throw in? I was wondering about the bump map. Oh, the bump map. I totally forgot about the bump map. Uh, here we have our uh, our normal map. And I will this take a regular bump? Let's go ahead and just try it anyway. Go ahead and click select. And we have our diffuse. Now, what did I name that? Because it's visible right here. It's called chain link bump. So that would be up near the top. I don't think it's actually going to work that way. No, but, nope, but uh, go ahead and leave it selected. Okay. And then go ahead and close that window. Mm -hmm. Now, in your project, go to where you have the chain link bump. Mm -hmm. Click on it. And then over here in texture type, about middle there way right there. Yep, change that to normal map. And then from there where it says bumpiness, change that down to about 0 0.025. All right, let's just type that in because that's a lot of numbers, 0 0.025. And then hit apply. And hit apply. Now what this is going to do is it's going to take a grayscale image and convert it into a bump map. And because it's a fence and it's such a small detail, you don't want a lot of bumpiness and it won't look very realistic. Now I got to admit, I haven't done that before and that's like one of the most awesome things ever, what you just showed me. So we just took a regular plain Jane bump map and turned it into a normal map on the fly. Now, if we go back over to our material, you'll see we now have a normal map in there, and we need to make sure this is tiling appropriately as well. In fact, if we look really closely, and this may not even be showing up in the video, uh, we have this little tiny chain link pattern and then a great big bump pattern underneath it, which looks neat, but kind of useless. And if we get really close to our chain link fence, we get some really weird shading artifacts, but no real bump showing up. We need to make sure our tiling on the normal map matches what's going on with our diffuse. So let's go to 25 by 20 and press enter, and suddenly we get a lot more life out of this. Mm -hmm. So there we go, awesome. So now we've got our bump map, we've got our diffuse map, and everything is looking good, except for the fact that our tunnel just kind of sits out here in the middle of nowhere. So I'm gonna grab the tunnel object, and notice, I can expand down and you can see all of the bits and pieces that make it up. We don't want to mess with those. We want to grab it at the tunnel level, and we'll hit W to grab the move tool, and we'll just slide this back. Now you can do other things to it. You could scale it up if you wanted to, you could rotate it if you wanted it to face a specific direction. You have all that kind of power, but we'll leave it just kind of plugged right here into the wall. And let's go ahead and just press play and see what this looks like. So it'll take us a minute to get out there, but we've got our fast forward hovercraft mode. And here we are. And we see our chain link fence. We see the tunnel. It's all there. Now there is one critical flaw, and that is that our chain link fence has all of the stopping power of tissue paper. We can go right through it. As a matter of fact, we can go right into the tunnel, which looks a little creepy and scary when we do that. But we'll talk about how to fix that a little bit later. For now, though, I'm going to go ahead and uh, move over, and let's bring in the camp. Now this should go a whole lot faster, mostly because really at this point you know all the basics to it. And also, because we exported it with the proper scale factor adjustment, Everything should just more or less work when we bring it in. So let's come over here to the camp area. And we need to import our FBX for it as well. So let's close up our materials and all this other stuff. We'll select the My FBX folder. Make sure that that is selected before we import. We'll come under Assets, Import New Asset, and we'll just bring in our camp. Give that a moment to process just like we did before. And it's already here, so that's great. So now you can see the actual uh, prefab itself. It's got the little tiny 3D box next to it. And we can drag that in. And there we go. There's our tent, our campground, our benches. I'll go ahead and hit F so we can kind of frame up on it. Now we can position this. Let's go ahead and hit the E key, and that'll bring up our rotate tool. And I want to rotate this in a perfectly flat manner. So I'm going to click on the green axis. This will rotate it around the Y axis sort of spin everything around 
and then we'll bring it out a little ways from the wall of the cliff back there. Now, because I did not uh, condense everything down to a single polygon mesh, we still have some editability in where everything is at this point. We're not limited uh, to leaving this all as one object, though we can move it, as you saw, in, in one object form by grabbing the camp uh, object at the very top. Now, if we expand the camp game object, underneath this we see the bench, we see the fire pit, we see the tent, etc. and so on. So I can take each one of these benches and we can scoot them around a little. So we could say maybe bring this bench a little closer to the fire, push it down into the ground a little bit more if you wanted to do that. We could take bench number two, scoot it over. Now I'm just making random adjustments just to show you that you can. Uh, you could even do something a little more bizarre if you were so inclined. You could grab uh, like the tent, for example, and hit Control D. Now, as soon as we do this, we do get a warning that we're about to lose the connection to our parent object. That's fine. I'm not worried about that. We'll go ahead and click continue. And now we actually have a second tent. So if we wanted two tents for our campsite, we can do that. Or when we had a whole campground, we could have put all the uh, different campsites in. Heck yeah, that would have been great. All we needed at that point is, you know, some you know, tennis courts. and <laughs> you know, Anyways. So now uh, we've got all of this set up. And really, that's that's it. Well, did you want to show them uh, the... Uh what happens with the character controller when you scale it back down to something a little bit more reasonable? Actually, let's just take a look at the character controller now that we've got our campsite in. Now, you'll notice that everything looks about right. I mean, mm. that, that's a biggish tent. I mean, usually when I go camping, I don't have a tent that large, but I've seen tents that large, so it doesn't look too scary. And these benches look, you know, nice and big and comfy, but not, you know, particularly too terribly oversized. But... If we take a look at our character controller, come back over here to the first person controller. First off, we have our height setting, which is currently set to two meters. Mm -hmm. So let's pull this down. Now, what do you want to set this down to, Lee? Uh, let's go about 1.67. All right. One. That'll put you at about five and a half foot okay. for our eye height. And you see that our little capsule inside shrinks down a little bit. Now, what else do we need to change? We need to change the camera offset. All right. So let's grab the main camera. So dial that down to about... 0.835 on the Y. All right, so we'll grab our Y transform that's underneath position at the very top, and we're going to set that to what again? 0 0.835. 835, and that's going to be analogous to what, about five and a half feet, you well, said? Well, it's, it's about half of the uh, 1.67, so it okay. should put your eye height at about five and a half foot. All right. So now we hit play, and now our tent feels a whole lot bigger. Our campfire looks really big. Our benches look massive. But this is about how they really are. Mm -hmm. So you've just seen two ways to tackle the same problem. We could have built everything at a more natural size inside of Maya. And then when we brought it in, simply changed our, our first-person controller. Or, you know, you can also just bulk things up. It depends on a lot of different factors and how you're building. Right. Usually, when you're getting into it, you, you have to be aware of where the camera is going to be above the ground because it changes your sense of scale. Now, if you were to take the same thing, run around in the world, mm -hmm. you'll notice that the whole world seems bigger. Oh, everything feels bigger. So, Because we're a lot closer to the ground now, and that's just kind of yep. how it works. So it's just an illusion that you have to be aware of. But if you're designing to a set of specs and you have a team of asset um, asset. Developers. Builders, yeah, builders for you, developers. Yeah. You need to know ahead of time what scale everything's supposed to be built in. Otherwise, you'll find yourself in a situation in the future where assets that you get aren't going to line up with other assets that come from other developers. They may not fit in the world, and you're going to have a lot of problems scaling everything out. That's right. You don't want to waste time doing that. Now, on, uh, on that note, I did just tap undo several times to put everything back where it was because we had already kind of built everything with this default height in mind. So I think with that, we have everything all established. We've brought in our objects, and you'll notice none of them collide at this point, and that's something we're actually going to take a look at in the next video, how to set up colliding objects to keep our player from just walking through the tent, from walking through the chain link fence, and all that sort of thing. But unless there's anything else you want to throw out... No, that's it for me. Okay, then we, that wraps things up for this video. Thanks a lot.